Good afternoon, everybody. I don't know if that's on. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us on the panel, Writing the Natural World. Um, I'm joined this afternoon by three really acclaimed writers, uh, Bridget Pitt, Isabel Dixon, and Peter Oudendal. And they have written three really beautiful books that we're going to discuss. Um, I am Kanya Fulyun. I am a theater and filmmaker predominantly. And so I was quite taken aback when I was asked to facilitate this conversation um, and quite honored to have this conversation with you. And I hope I do it some justice. Um, and I'm looking forward to inviting the audience to join us at the end for a question and answer session. I am going to make a slight disclaimer that Isabel has been slightly double scheduled and will have to run quite soon after our event. So unfortunately, she won't be able to sign her book. Um, but if you do want a signed copy, she will be at... Um, I'll be back here to sign. She'll be back at 6.30 or she will be at another conversation at the... Exclusive book books. Exclusive books. Tuesday, but also you can drop me a line via my website if you have any issues and we'll make a plan. <laughs> cool. I'm going to start by introducing our writers to you. So Isabel Dixon was born in Tata and grew up in Graf Reinet. She now works in publishing in London, returning frequently to her family home in the Great Karua. She won the Sunlim Prize in 2000 for the unpublished manuscript of her debut collection, Weather Eye. Published by the Carapace Poets in 2001, Weather Eye was awarded the Olive Schreiner Prize in 2004. Her fifth collection, A Whistling of Birds, with illustrations by Douglas Robertson, is published by Himan and Rousseau. A Whistling of Birds plays, pays close attention and striking attention to our threatened natural world with echoes and glimpses from other writers and artists, including D.H. Lawrence, Elizabeth Bishop, Albert Adams, and Georgia O'Keeffe. Her further collections are A Fold in the Map, Bearings, and The Tempter's Prognosticator, which J.M. Kutzia described as a virtuoso collection. Her poems have appeared in journals and anthologies around the world and have been translated into several languages. Peter Oudendal is a poet, playwright, translator, and editor. His debut collection, Asof Gien Berge Oet Hier Gewoon Het Nie, was published by Tafelberg and received the 2019 Ingrid Jonker Prize. His poems have appeared in various local and international journals and he has performed throughout South Africa, in the Netherlands, Nigeria, England, Peru, and Ecuador. He was the executive director of InSync Poetry from 2015 to 2019. Along with Anal Pitesse and Bongeni Nongkongkwana, he is the co-editor of the translation anthologies Many Tongues, which was published in 2013, and Converse, which was published in 2018. Woodendall holds a PhD in creative writing from the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, which he received in 2020, and currently teaches creative writing at Northwest University in Pochevstroom. His play, Droomwerk, received the 2021 Artie Coffee of Woodfeki for Best New Drama Script and made its debut at the National Arts Festival in 2023. He is the translator of Gonzalo M. Tavares' Portuguese novel, Jerusalem, into Afrikaans, which was published by Minimal Press. Woodendahl's second poetry collection, Und Art, appeared at Tafelberg in 2023. Our final writer, Bridget Pitt, is a South African author and environmental activist who has published poetry, short fiction, non-fiction, and three novels. Unbroken Wing, which was published by Quela in 1998, the Unseen Leopard, which was published by Human and Rousseau in 2010, and Notes from the Lost Property Department, which was published by Penguin in 2015. Two were long-listed for the Sunday Times Literary Awards. Her second novel was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Book Prize in 2011 and the Wale Sionka African Literature Award in 2012. She has recently co-authored a memoir of the Spiritual Wilderness Guide, Sitrelo Mbata, 
which is entitled Black Lion Alive in the Wilderness and was published by Jonathan Ball in 2021. Her short fiction has received a Commonwealth nomination and has been published in anthologies in South Africa, Canada, and the United Kingdom. I, Brother Horn is her North American debut. So thank you so much to all three of you for joining us. I'm now going to invite them to read some extracts from either their poetry collections and from I, Brother Horn, so that you can hear some of these wonderful writings on nature and some of the imagery and language they use to describe it, um, just to give a bit more of a context and feeling to the conversation we're going to have. And I'm gonna ask Isabel to start us off. Thank you, Kanya. Thank you to everybody for being here this Friday afternoon. Uh, it's wonderful to be back at Open Book. Uh, the last time I was on this stage uh, was with Gus Ferguson, who uh, introduced uh, a previous collection of mine, The Tempest Prognosticator. Uh, he's sadly no longer with us, but he's very much with poetry and poets in spirit because he inspired so many of us. And A Whistling of Birds, which is published today, is dedicated to him, uh, a, great, uh, a, a great artist and poet himself and a great lover of nature. So it feels right uh, and wonderful to be invited uh, to be on this panel today, uh, which is also my sister's birthday. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read uh, two of the early poems, the second and third poems in the collection. And um, the first one is, in a way, in conversation with the great American poet, James Wright, who wrote a beautiful poem called A Blessing. I don't have time to read the whole of A Blessing to you first. I wish I did, but look it up. It's on, on, on the internet, um, poetry, on the American Poets website. And I referred to a line from that about a body breaking into blossom after this experience that the speaker in his poem has, encountering horses by the side of the road. The fence. Break into blossom, break. What is the point of perfect surfaces, the aluminium shine of life, the lacquer glaze of soft closed doors, Step from the car and shake your limbs out off of the tar, away from the ticking metal cooling down, over the crunch of gravel to the fence, just a wavering stripe times three of wire. No need to grip the fence post, climb, even though you'd easily swing one leg and then the other over it, Part the cross strands, high and low, and duck right through. Feel the way this marks your rebirth as a trespasser on the other side. And now wait for the welcome party, horses nuzzling you, the newly chosen one, or the cry and leap of something wildly different, the sheer indifference of sly-eyed goats, or this alone, the testing silence of an outcrop silhouette and tilting stars. After James writes a blessing. In nature, a fallen silver birch to balance on, a perfect roof of beech, Breathing perch, crown of leaf, a quiet encapsuling of green, place to be seen and not be seen, make sense of what you are and mean. And then I'm going to finish with a third poem a little deeper in the collection, which is called Sweet Violet. And I'm going to find my way to it shortly. <laughs> the funny thing about a new book is you think you know where the <laughs> poems are and then you're not quite sure. Um, but this one is after the center of the book. Sweet Violet. Beautiful bath swoon, V 
viola odorata, not for sleep like lavender, but for the sense, sense of the self, the self immersed, bruised, veined, but whole and here, and steeped into a place of rare discovery, scent catapult, deep memory, falling to the still core gilded in a shaded flower's eye. It's not the color, though what purple. Otherwise, I'd love the pansies too, but they seem garish, huge, beside the violet's perfect modesty. Almost secretive, a tiny cluster poised like elven irises above its cupping wreath of leaves. A little finger flare of flowers set soft against the bark. Finding its space between the roots, the ferns, some mossy place for you to chance upon. And then the sweet elation of the breath, this earth and angel scent. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. I'm going to ask Peter. Uh, to read us one of his poems. <laughs> <coughs> okay, I'm here. A sweet breath. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so if you don't know yet, it's an Afrikaans collection. Um, so I was thinking I, I would read two poems, the one I translated uh, into English and the other one, the second one will be in the original Afrikaans. <coughs> River Mouth. Milneton Beach. I am a gathering of waters, a meeting of salt and fresh, where oyster catches, gulls, humans stream through the tides, where rivers seek the ocean and waves need land, always unfinished, tempestuous mouth. Table Bay lies between the mountain and I. The city blooms detached to buildings that are decidedly uninterested in water. But the sea doesn't whirlpool. She remembers the ships full of slaves and barser who came here to quench their thirst after months of salt and sweat, who came to wash and to forget. I see two ships en route to the Cape, the one from the north and Woodendal on deck, VOC soldier Willem Adrian mutating in my cells. The second from Madagascar, Diana trapped in the bow, bound along with other unblessed ones for yes ma'ams, bowing, starting afresh. She bears her boss's child. Susanna thrives despite the blood. Maris Willem Adrian, Ma Diana disappears. Woodendals flood the land. I am a gathering of waters, a meeting of salt and fresh, where oyster catches, gulls, humans stream through the tide, where rivers seek the ocean and waves need land, always unfinished, tempestuous mouth. Okay, and the second one was... Um, um, inspired, I don't want to say inspired, but yes, it followed the massive felt fires in New South Wales in December uh, 2019. It was my reaction to the, you know, the sun was like this pink dot in the sky for days on end. Um, so yes, and so this poem followed from there. Stuak. <coughs> Die son is weke lang a flow pink kool en roet en rou gehul. Sluiers oor haar enkel oog, sy star en weir om te huil. Die waterval waar ons laas mand was, sy wout brand af. Net die siedende gloed, die geblaas van vuur, mure. Hulle seng skree meters hoog die licht in. Ewe ouwe getuies van reen en bas val een na die ander en woed horizontaal uit. Niemand hoor hoe al zilium opskiet, niemand hoor die getjank en geskor, die gebreek en gejou nie. Kangaroos en luislange vlug en vind nie groen nie. Die reek van brandende hare, die oorgee van miljoene geeste, hulle golf nes die hitte boon toe, die berge rook hulle uit. 
ons gooi petrol in die kar en laat baai oor smeel in die jewel see toe. Die verbrande reste van muskiete en baie, koalas en dingo's, guanas en boestukies, arreveer saam met ons rivier langs op die strand. Ons asem dooi is in en uit. Ons asem dooi is in en uit. Die longe buiten ons longe verkool. Ons vreed slapchips onder een wraaklistige son. Sy verf pink love letters in die golwe vol as vir die skare in die wind en in die water. Die skare in ons hare en in ons bloed. En sy weier vir een fok om te huil. And I'll, yeah, I'm going to ask Bridget to read. Thank you. Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little challenging when I'm reading prose <laughs> because it inevitably sounds a little prosaic <laughs> <laughs> after poetry. But uh, anyway, the sections I've chosen, this is, so the protagonist, or one of the protagonists of the novel is a boy called Daniel who's the son of missionaries. And he has a, a very strong connection to animals that, that starts from birth when he has an encounter with a rhino when he's very young. And this runs into conflict with, as he grows up, with the expectations of his father um, and the kind of philo philo philosophical underpinnings of Christianity that, you know, animals are there to serve humans and they're, they're not equal and they don't have souls. Um, so he's been wrestling with this, and his mother's very ill, and he makes a bargain with God that if he can bring himself to kill an animal, then, then God will make his mother better. The morning is cool and misty, smudging the trees into a shadow world that maroons him in solitude. A steady drizzle falls, soaking his clothes and sending cool trickles running down his neck. The birds are silent, save for the mournful call of the umguguana bird. He feels an undercurrent of fear, a sense of small, tender creatures scuttling into the undergrowth, warning each other. For he is no longer a rhino's child, a boy who can dissolve himself into animals. He is a man with a gun, a man with a mission to claim his birthright and prove his faith and the dread of thee will fall on all the beasts of the earth. Half a mile down the river, he picks up the spoor of a red dacre, each footprint imprinted on the damp soil like two teardrops. He follows it reluctantly, relieved when it disappears, sickened when it reveals itself again. The gun grows heavier with each step. When he finally sees the buck, he is shocked by its physicality, as if he had imagined that the spoor would lead not to a living creature, but to some ghostly apparition like the one in his dream. It is on the far side of the clearing with its back to him, rubbing itself against the tree, causing a small shower of leaves and raindrops. He moves noiselessly behind a bush, cock loads the gun, cocks it softly and raises it to his shoulder. The buck swings to face him, ears twitching, dark eyes alert. A young male with sharp, small sharp horns tipped with black as if they had been scorched in a fire. Its wing-like ears are lined with droplets of water clinging to the silver fur. Two black strips run from its liquid dark eyes like the mark of tears. The buck can't see him through the mist and the thick foliage. After a few seconds, it turns its back and carries on rubbing itself against a tree. He squints along the barrel, feels himself travel down the gun into the buck's body. His ears twitch, his feet are hoofed and cloven. The bark of the tree is rough against his fur. He fights the trembling in his hands to hold the gun steady. He owes the buck that, at least, to shoot true. He squeezes one trigger, then the other. The lead shot slams into his heart. His legs crumble and all goes dark as his life is shocked out of him.
So I'm going to start the conversation where throughout reading all three of your books, I'm going to call it, um, the thing that really struck me, at least, was this constant tension between the ego, the human, and the eco-centric experience, and this, this sort of dance between, uh, between the tension that is nature and our reliance, our need for it, and then the, the very havoc we create in needing it so desperately. Um, and I, it's interesting, I actually, Peter, I've thought about Refirmont and uh, even rainfall, Ach, Isabel rainfall on Karabi seen from, with the, with the phones and this desperate need to capture something. And Bridget, the entire book, her book moves between these titles. So you're either reading from D Daniel or from Moses. And I kept thinking there's this third unwritten title, which is the landscape speaking constantly. Um, and we slip sometimes, and it's like we get to see it from the landscape's perspective. And I was wondering, and I would like to open it to all three of you, if you could speak maybe more to this tension of the ego and the eco and this dance constantly we feel. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a current tension we all feel between where we stand as, as beings and this world we inhabit and how you write <laughs> for that. Do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> Whoever has the strongest impulse. <laughs> Maybe Bridget, seeing as you you read. Well, I think I mean I think that's very much a lot what this book is about. Um, because I was trying to explore what colonialism did to this country. Um, I mean <laughs> that's a little over ambitious, but some aspects of it. Um, and in particular, I was looking at the immense disruption that it brought to the natural world, but also to the, the human world um, and to the relationship of the, the local indigenous human world to the natural world as well. Um, so a lot of my books, book is about that. And I use the characters of Daniel and Moses. Moses is a Zulu child who's raised by the missionaries as well. Um, so Daniel has this, this encounter with the rhino very early, which in a sense ev evicts his human ego to some extent. Mm. Um, it's almost like it's shocked out of him. And because it's shocked out of him, he, he finds it very hard to be the person that he's supposed to be, um, which in the context of a sort of British colonial subject in the 19th century, was someone who had very little sympathy or very little empathy with, with animals and the wild animals around them, um, very little connection to land, and who was there as primarily as a colonizer, as someone who was going to occupy the land, uh, who was going to dominate the land. And the way this played out amongst the colonialists was by just an unbelievable decimation of wildlife. Um, by the hunters and both for sport and for, for trading. But also on the landscape, you know, as forests were felled and um, bush felt was raised and the sugar cane was planted in that area. It, it, was a, it was a tremendous assault. So I think it was that, you know, I was just kind of questioning where does this ego come from mm. that, that enables you to come to a land and impose yourself to that extent. I think that's what I was trying to explore in the book. Mm. Mm. There's one, I'm gonna misquote you horrendously now, but there's one of the favorite, my favorite lines in the book is, no, I'm gonna find it. <laughs> <laughs> For the sake of not misquoting you while I'm in your company. Um, there's a line where you write, um, the men complain of the hut tax, the low wages for farm work, the pressing of the English farmers around them. Soon there will be no more place to graze our cattle, they say. Truly, these English people eat the land. 
And it was that final line, truly these English people eat the land, that really stuck with me because I thought it was such a beautiful way to express it, that there's this consumption. Mm. Um, yeah, it really stuck with me. Mm. Isabel, I'm going to yeah. throw the question to yeah. you. <laughs> no, I'm, I've been musing on what Bridget read and, and spoke about and that impact of... Um, the desire to build empires, which always means huge destruction, mm. swathes of destruction. And um, although much of my collection is about uh, nature directly and observing nature closely and, and, and their interaction uh, sometimes of the human and the animal, there's, there's a, there is a number of poems there that, that speak directly to conflict and war and exile. Mm. Um, the First World War, um, which also speaks in conversation with the great First World War poet Isaac Rosenberg mm. um, and his poem about larks, the singing of larks mm -hmm. in the middle of this incredible destruction in the trenches of the Somme. And um, I was just thinking as Bridget spoke about uh, Ukraine mm. and, and how any assault on humanity is mm. a massive assault on the environment at the same time. You think of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which I've written about in my previous um, collection, Bearings, and that, you know, how long, you know, the, the world takes to recover from our attempt to, to kill our fellow man and, and destroying things along the way. Um, in Syria, I have a poem about Syria, which speaks about how Duma used to smell of roses. It's looking at the Damascus rose and 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 that sort of and not just economies and humans, mm. but but nature being destroyed in its wake. Mm. Uh, yeah, the ego. I mean, the ego that 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 wants to impose and shout mm. and not to stop and listen. Mm. And and if anyone gets anything from some of these poems, I I hope it's to create moments of stillness mm. and reflection and increase our desire to um, seek those refuges in nature, but also to fight to make more of that unspoiled and protected nature available to others less fortunate than we are. Mm. Um, I think for me, the whole idea of ego versus ego sets up a false dichotomy between the two. And I think it's because of uh, that it is, um, seeing those two things separately that we've allowed ourselves to end up in a space where we are facing multiple crises and uh, ecological collapse and kind of you know all these weather phenomena that that we are that have been seeing especially this year in the northern hemisphere and I think a lot of us are kind of waiting to see what's going to happen in our summer uh, when we get here. So that that to me uh, that. Um, sense of seeing the self as separate from the more than human world, mm -hmm. from the environment, mm -hmm. is precisely what has led us, mm -hmm. you know, here. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess, firstly, uh, at least what I'm trying to do in this collection mm -hmm. is to be a witness to this rapidly um, collapsing um, more than human world around us, but also to challenge the centrality of the ego of the self and that illusion of separateness, you know, mm. that we aren't constantly exchanging um, uh, physically, spiritually, uh, emotionally, and psychologically with the environment mm. around us, and that we are somehow immune to it, you know, mm. that we don't carry the same pollutants in our bodies mm. that, that we see um, in, the, in the sewers and on the streets. So, so yes, I think trying to move beyond that, that mm. um, dichotomy and just also to try and verbalize um, this sense of unrootedness that, that a lot of us are experiencing. Mm. Mm. I'm going to, for the sake of time, because I'm watching it move at a rapid speed, mm. I'd actually prepared very beautiful separate questions for you all. And I'm going to instead, if that's OK with you all, keep this a, because it's, it's quite interesting to hear each one's take on it. I'm going to keep it a collective conversation, just because I am watching it move. Um, so on on the note of of destruction of landscape sort of being consumed, I think a really interesting thing that also struck me is is uh, what I would then like to pose is this idea that 
landscape is also memory. Um, and that specifically in a country like South Africa, if we were to locate ourselves for a second, I think it's really interesting when you start to think about specifically Bridget and, and Peter, I think your work quite specifically, sometimes it, it really strongly locates itself here um, in South Africa. And I was reading a book by Simon Skama, and I, I, I just want to read a quote, if that's okay. Um, and it's called Landscape and Memory. And so in this book he writes, there's an elaborate frame through which our adult eyes survey the landscape. Before it can ever be a response or repose for the senses, landscape is the work of the mind. Its scenery is built up as much from strata, strata of memory as from layers of rock. And I sat with this as I was reading your works. And I, I'm wondering, what I'm asking you is, when you're writing, and as we're writing The Natural World, the question I'm asking is, how much of the landscape around us, how much of the natural world is both memory, and I think I'm, I'm purposefully <laughs> tugging at strings here, where our memory, our histories are complicated and are, are deeply challenging, um, and how do we start to write that? if it is so layered. Mm. Maybe I'm gonna start with Peter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, in, in terms of the process of writing and being in a, in a space, um, <clears throat> it helps to just sit and be with the, the space and to listen, as you said, uh, really just to you know, hone your senses and try to um, become aware of what it is that you are taking in from the um, environment that you're in. Um, but I think, uh, yes, I mean, there, there is this, and it, it, it comes back to this ego, ego thing, because you see the mountain, but you might, maybe it's a space you know, and so the mountain also means it brings up memories for you, and it's, it's all these things, but then how do you acknowledge the mountain in its mountainness, you mm. know? Is it possible to just be a witness or can you only always just be in conversation mm. uh, with, with, with what you see around you? Um, and I think also, um, just as a, as a related point, you know, is the um, ethical imperative, I think, to acknowledge the human interactions with the landscape that you've been in, uh, and especially, you know, in, in a space such as South Africa, how violent it has been, and to, to really become aware of those histories. So I guess it's, it's both... For me, it's both of those things, trying to be in the present and not to impose in a way, in a similar way that my predecessors might have in this space, mm -hmm. but then also being constantly aware of the history uh, that that space carries and especially the history of movement and um, change and destruction of humans in that space. Mm. I'm going to... I'm gonna uh, share now. I just want to keep tugging at this. Yes. So, is uh, what I, I guess what I'm asking is, is part of sitting with a natural landscape, sitting with the memories that landscape has held, and acknowledging that some of those memories might not be yours, but that it does hold m a multitude of memories. Yes, and I mean also, for instance, say the trees themselves. Uh, carry the history of that landscape in the way in which they have been formed, in how they are angled, in how big or small, how tall they manage to grow. They carry traces of the landscape in that way, in the mi minerals that are in the soil. Mm -hmm. um, so also acknowledging, I guess, different aspects of the landscape as bearers of their own mm -hmm. memory yes. of that space. Mm -hmm. Isabella. I was just thinking about that wonderful example of trees. Yeah. Uh, it made me think about the amazing book, The Overstory. Yes. If you haven't read The Overstory, go and buy it at the book lounge after this session. Oh, what, a, what an amazing way into yeah. Yeah. human life, uh, the environment, trees, all the trees carry with them and all we lose when we lose them. Um, I have a poem in my collection which imagines a world, a future world without trees and how we would have to rely on memory. Um, it's called When the Light Filtered Through the, through the Leaves. Mm. Um, but thinking about South African spaces, um, uh, a few of my previous collections have m many more uh, overtly South African landscape poems uh, in them, especially The Tempest Prognosticator and The Fold in the Map, which is very much looking at being in a different country, being in Scotland and England, and 
reaching back through memory to my childhood and especially uh, the Eastern Cape, the Karoo, Khrafranet, um, where I grew up. But I, one of the poems that feels for me really important personally in this collection, I think all poems that, that one writes feel important, but it was a lockdown poem at a time when you couldn't reach, you couldn't go and sit in a, another landscape and experience it and write about it. I was thinking about landscapes that I, I had no access to because I couldn't fly anywhere, I couldn't get back to South Africa. And I was thinking about Kirstenbosch and of course Cape Town and all of its complex, layered, uh, divided history. And I chanced upon uh, a painting uh, called Kirsten Bosch, Bosch. Just fortunately, it was in a auction catalogue. And it was a painting by the South African artist Albert Adams, uh, whom, to my shame, I had never really known about his art. So that I, I wrote a poem describing um, this painting, which is snakes um, in uh, a, a, a stand of Stradizio flowers and there's lots of snakes in the collection. But I wanted to really think quite deeply about what it means uh, for an artist like him to not have been allowed to study at the Michaela School of Art and him to only get his uh, real study opportunities in Europe and then having spent the rest of his life in England painting. Um, yeah, so that layering of memory and landscape, sometimes you are fortunate enough to be in it and, uh, and write in, in the moment, you know, as it were. But it's our duty, I feel, as writers and, and poets in particular, to be attentive and carry that with you and then make those connections constantly and being alert to the connections that, that you, you feel compelled to write about. Mm. Yeah, I, think, I mean, there's so much in that question. Um, I just, you know, one of the... The scenes in the book is, is when they, they're doing something called stumping, which is basically the trees have now been cut down, and now they're digging out the stumps to um, clear the thing for sugar cane. And as Daniel's doing this, he, say, he looks at it and says, does the stump remember being a tree? Does the earth remember the feel of the elephant's feet? Mm -hmm. And I think it is that thing of how much memory does the, the earth hold? Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, I mean, it does. It does. It, it holds physical memory mm. of of what has been there. But is is there something more intangible, perhaps, than the physical memory? Mm. Um, and I think with the colonial experience, what's quite interesting is, so the people who came to South Africa from England often were had quite a strong appreciation of nature in their own places, but they were coming to. They didn't have that kind of memory association. So it was much easier for them to be quite brutal on the landscape here because it didn't have that, that kind of sense of identity and memory that one forms in a landscape that you've grown up in. Mm. So I think that that foreignness really fed into the colonial experience. And I think also what the colonial experiences did and continue to do, you know, there was also this kind of romanticization of the African landscape mm. and an erasion of the humans who had lived here. Mm. Um, so there was this notion that we are coming to an untouched land. Mm. There, you know, there's so mm. much of that language. Mm. That it's, an, land. it's an untouched mm. and it's, it's, you know, the dark continent and no, no, nobody's ever set foot here. <laughs> um, and that, of course, is, a, is such an erosion of, mm. of people who, who are living here, but also of, of all of their memories. And by that, the way that they transform the landscape, I know, you know one of the Zulu characters in this book says, I no longer know um, my home mm. because it's so transformed by, by, you know, he talks about how he no longer sees the place where his cattle were grazing or where his father um, had his fields because it's been so transformed. Mm -hmm. So by, by transforming that landscape, you're also erasing identity and memory, mm. um, which is kind of so many layers mm. of, of erasion mm. and uh, violence that mm. was acted on the landscape and on the people. Mm. I think you make such an important point about um, needing to know something to, you really have to pay attention to it and know it and name it, y even if you're naming it just for yourself, 
to love it, appreciate it, and therefore protect it. And I'm really passionate about why, how we keep handing on to younger people uh, everywhere knowledge about nature, about you know, naming things and mm. showing things and say this, this is what you must protect, mm. you know, mm. uh, and appreciate. Yeah, I, I, I think I read somewhere that so many words, English words about nature have got lost. Mm. Mm. Descriptive words. I think I was, uh, that was the um, Robert McFarlane book, I think, or Robert McFarlane oh. might, might have yeah, spoken about those lost words. Yeah, about that, and, yeah. and just, I mean, so yeah. many, and it, it's such a, as, as we become more and more disconnected, mm. and that's we, our we job, lose the yeah. language. Yeah. It's our job to keep it. naming, mm. and naming, and, and reminding, and, and mm. describing. And I think in a way this is the really beautiful thing about what happens when you do write and whether that's poetry or prose and whether that's not necessarily the word, whether the word has gotten lost, but it's an act of trying to name again, it, it reenacts a memory, it remakes memory. Um, and I think that's a really, yeah, that's a, there's a really beautiful act in remembering um, or remembering again. Um, a final question from my side, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, I, Isabel, you've started to speak about it because it was the very experience I had when I was reading your collection, that thing about slowing down, and it really felt like you put a magnifying glass in my hand. It was like, look closely to the tiny, tiny thing. Um, and it made me think about, and then Peter, yours was it felt like an experience of going, imagine you're massive and you're this giant. He has this beautiful poem about the mountains meeting and I couldn't, and you've got one where you're inside of the, inside of the, um, like, earth. I don't know how to explain it otherwise. And, and so it was quite interesting sitting with these two poetry collections in my hand because Isabel, yours often, although there's, the Whale is one of my favorite poems as well. Um, it had this, it constantly did this thing where either I had to go into an extreme micro place or I had to do these macro imaginations, imaginaries in my mind. And it made me think of the very nature of nature, which is often either extreme micro organisms or we have to ask, or it's these macro experiences that we really can't imagine, the mountains around us, the trees. It's so big, we, we struggle to take it in. Um, and so I guess my final question is where, I need to see what I wrote down to myself. Um, can you speak to that, the very nature of nature and how that influences your writing? And I guess that's my, uh, the thoughts around that is the fact that it does do this thing. It moves from micro to macro. It moves from public to personal. It moves from shared to, to owned sometimes. It, it, it moves, it morphs. Um, and any final thoughts on the nature of nature? <laughs> <laughs> tiny, tiny question, huge question, a very, very huge question. I, I, I don't really have an answer, an answer <laughs> to that except to say that that's, you know, in writing you, 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 you go where the thoughts take you and sometimes those are zooming out and sometimes it's zooming in mm. and sometimes you have really cosmic experiences of nature or this morning when I went on my run I was stretching and I was watching the ants in the crack in the paving and you know that's mm. just life <laughs> and experiencing and paying attention to things. Mm -hmm. Richard? Yeah I thought it was interesting that you kind of brought this dichotomy which is not really a dichotomy I suppose but a continuum um, because the two characters in my book Daniel's got this kind of very intimate connection with nature very grounded and earthy whereas his adopted brother Moses is, is very into physics and astronomy. astronomy yeah. um, and there's this description here where, where Moses is, is lying on the ground. It says, he feels the earth beneath him, the sticks and the grass and stones meeting his skin, and the mass of it beneath the grass with its hidden entanglement of tree roots and tunneling earthworms, and beneath that the hard rocks in the earth's center he pictures the earth spinning on its axis, its slow revolution around the sun, the planets in the solar system, the galaxies beyond, the patterns and mathematical formula that hold them all in perpetual motion, 
an eternal constant relationship. Mm. So I think it's that, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that we walk around with this constant kind of going in and going out. Mm. Uh, you know, I sit and I'm sometimes flabbergasted by the thought that my body's actually 80% weird microbes. <laughs> 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 and that I'm not a single entity at all. Yeah. And there's like a whole universe going on yeah. in there. And then I'm also flabbergasted at the thought that we're so small I mean, mm. in, in the kind of grand scheme of things. But mm. also that the, the creatures are so connected. I mean, two of the poems um, reference creatures that navigate by the stars. Mm. Yes. Um, the poem, the dung beetle mm. and, and crabs, you mm. know, who, who, who views, yeah, they, the stars. they have that cosmic awareness too. You know. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> What I was thinking of uh, when, when listening to your responses and, and the question is, is just, I mean, this amazing capacity that we have to, you know, be able to imagine, say, what it might be like to be a little chloroplast organelle in a cell of a leaf exchanging, um, you know, sunlight and water and, and making energy and, and oxygen, you know, like... That, that ability or, or for instance, if you, you, can, you can imagine diving into the soil and being able to swim through it, you know, mm -hmm. what, what is it that you would encounter as you swim your way through the soil, right? Mm -hmm. Just that ability to, to then, I mean, I hope some of you at least had a feeling now or a sense <laughs> of, of what it would be um, or imagining it, what it's like to be a mountain. Mm -hmm. um, um, Anki Kroch also has this like a famous mm. series of poems about about uh, Urikwahu, right? She mm. imagines it and observes it day after day, and and I think that's part of what we what we bring to the table as 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 writers in this uh, you know broken relationship that 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 we seem to to have cultivated with the more than natural world, how ach, more than human world. How can we? Uh, yes. Yeah, how can we? Phrase. How can we? How can we imagine ourselves back into? Um, mm. that which we are and that which um, surrounds us. Um, so, yes. So your homework is to go away and, and uh, paint or write the molecular and the mountainous, <laughs> you know, when yes. your spare time this weekend. <laughs> I think it's a great task. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to open it up to the audience. If anyone has any questions to our writers or to the group as a whole, I see a couple of hands. Hello. Um, I just first want to acknowledge that I think that the work you guys are doing, it's so incredibly important. Um, I believe art and imagination will be crucial to the way we move forward um, when facing the current environmental crisis. Um, I did my honours um, on puppetry and how it melts with ecological thinking. Um, and in that, I um, read Timothy Morton's work. And in that, he talks about uh, what Peter mentioned, the dangers of viewing nature with a capital N mm. and as a tapestry mm. and how that removes us from it. But then I'm thinking about what Isabel said about the power in paying attention to nature. And when you not view it as a tapestry per se, but more as an outsider, you can really take it in and appreciate it, which is also crucial to moving forward. Um, so that's a, a tricky thing. Like, do, you, do we need to more view ourselves as a mesh with nature or separate to it. Um, so I guess my question would be, um, as artists and writers, then how do you navigate that? I suppose a lot of what, I, some of what I'm reaching towards and I'm writing is, is trying to forget about even writing, you know, just that experience um, on the skin. Um, and yeah, so I, I don't, I don't feel that there is a huge dichotomy between observing and uh, paying attention. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't feel that I'm separate. I mean, in a way, I'm saying that the closer attention you pay and the, the mm. stiller you are, the more thoughtful you are, the more aware you are of your 
oneness, you know, away from the baubles of anxiety that are our telephones and our cars and, um, but yeah, we have to live our lives as well. Thank you for another great panel. Uh, sorry, can you were going to say something? Or? No, I'm just acknowledging that I saw a hand down here for the next one. Awesome, thank you. Um, lovely panel. I was going to ask, um, <laughs> one, the cliche I hate most um, in like South African writing or talk most is uh, the whole cry the beloved country ideal of like seeing South Africa as being incredibly beautiful but has so many problems. Like <laughs> there's that feeling of like, the, like almost nature um, is kind of disappointed in us almost for having, <laughs> for politically and for human beings being so bad in such a beautiful country and, and that kind of thing. Um, but I often think that uh, nature writing has a kind of dilemma where when you're writing about nature, is it a consolation from life, from human beings, and those persons, or is it about transcending human life and being and trying to write something more than than what's anthropocentric, what's about human beings. Like, I don't know if you each kind of have a way of doing that, or is that how you see your writing? Um, or is it something completely different? I think Bridget uh, wants to. Yeah, um, it's interesting that, because, you know, I was thinking about this, because this is talk is writing about nature. And I was thinking, oh, is that something I do? <laughs> um, and for me, I, I don't see where one begins and one, one ends. I mean, there, there's a lot of nature in this book, but it's, it's part of the human experience as well. Um, and, and I do get what you're saying. I know there is this kind of narrative, you know, South Africa's beautiful, but... Um, and I, I think that is part of that colonial um, kind of viewing of, of the place as, as, you know, here's the nature and here are the people and, and, and they're, they're like separate things. The nature is something that you put on postcards or, or put behind a fence in, the, in a, a game park, you know, and then you put the people there, um, which is, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's been disastrous for all of us socially and, in fact, ecologically to have that approach. So to me, we are nature. You know, I mean, one of my favorite slogans coming out of the climate crisis is we are nature defending itself. We are nature. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's just we're a very destructive species within nature, but we are nature. And we need to stop seeing ourselves as somehow distinct and start recognizing our utter dependency um, mm. and communality with nature. So as a writer, to me, they're not separate. I can't write about nature without writing about people, and I can't write about mm. people without writing about nature. Mm. Mm. Any other thoughts? Summed it up well. We have a question down here. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to, I think my question follows on from what Bridget was speaking about, the climate crisis, the environmental crisis. To what extent, when you're writing, are you thinking about your role in addressing the environmental crisis? And to what extent do you think you can be effective or have some kind of impact in addressing the way we relate to the natural world? Would like to ask Peter, you yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think about it every day anyway, whether I'm writing or not writing. Um, and that's the best I can say is that, you know, one feels that what... I think you. I think we have to feel that what we do makes a difference, and whether and people have different roles. They have different personalities and, and roles. Some people are activists, and some people are writers, writer activists, and writer observers. And one has to examine one's own life uh, according to mm. how you think um, you can best contribute. But I also do think people do contribute in different ways, um, both in how in on the negative and the positive side. But again, that's about that stillness and, and work, working it out is our is our human the problem of the human condition. <laughs> how how we work out how best to uh, live the least destructive life. Mm -hmm. And I mean, <clears throat> just personally, I mean, it can be quite overwhelming, right? You read of all these natural disasters, microplastics in our bodies that are cancerogenic and, 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 and just kind of um, sometimes feel overwhelmed by it all and think what is it that you can actually do? And I think it 
links to what Isabel is saying is not, uh, you know, no single person probably is going to fix this, right? Um, but you know what it is that you can bring to the table and, and what, are, what are your strengths? What, what are the things that, that um, yes, that you can add? And I think expanding our imaginative possibilities, our capacity to imagine ourselves as mm. nature um, and, 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 and to sound the more than human world um, in a way. And also, I think, to, to verbalize all these inner storms that we experience on a daily basis as we are moving through this, through this crisis and a sense of perpetual loss, um, of being helpless, all of these um, uh, are, are things that we can help to, to give words to. Mm. Any, does that answer your question? <laughs> Any other questions? I thought I saw a tentative semi-hand at one stage, but maybe we've <laughs> answered that question. That question. I, I, I'm <laughs> often the one going, like, oh, oh, I'm just playing with my earring. <laughs> 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 So what I think about every day is which side is going to win, mm -hmm. um, not, to, not in terms of ecological facts and stats, but when I see all of us so um, far gone into our digital environment where we are um, increasingly disconnected from our natural environment, I keep wondering will there be, if there's time, a movement away, which we are, which is highly accelerated and very obvious in all of our minds and hearts, um, and then a, a pendulum swing back to feeling integrated with our environment, or will we, if there come a crisis where the earth just collapses us back into some kind of consciousness? Yes. So I'm talking about the effect of our integration with, with IT, basically, mm. as opposed to integration with nature. To me, they seem to be opposites. I may be wrong. Well, what do you, yeah. wh which, way, which way do you think it's going to go? It's, a, it's a, not a very small question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we need more of these in-person in human beings talking together, mm -hmm. but we these moments of, uh, of interaction directly are really important in stepping away from, from all the IT. Um, I can't see us stopping using IT anytime soon. Um. I, th I think there's a, a great tendency, a, a certain arrogance um, <coughs> that comes from this sort of anthropocentrism which ac accords ourselves and our creations enormous power and certainly, they, you know, we do have enormous destructive power and we need to recognize uh, what that is. But when you think of the impulse to life that drove those first tiny organisms however many million years ago and that long, long journey, um, you know, that's how I comfort myself when I'm feeling kind of desperate is... I think life has got a really powerful impulse because otherwise it wouldn't have been here. Mm. And I think that will, that will keep erupting again and again, um, whatever we do, however hard we try and stamp it out. Um, eventually we'll stamp <laughs> ourselves out. And I mean, that's the, the kind of saddest consolation is that we'll stamp ourselves out and then life will carry on. But I think we will come to our senses before that happens and find a way of living better mm. in the world. Because you have to think that, otherwise, what's, otherwise we might as well all go and jump in the sea. You have to think that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like Rebecca Solnit says, despair is not an option. I think it's hope, not an option. Hope, is, hope, hope yeah. is the option, and action. Yeah. Action with hope. Yeah, and then just not as an afterthought, but as a point of departure, I think... 
um, <clears throat> for me, it's it's been a journey to cultivate a spiritual relationship with the more than human world, to move beyond just physical memory and uh, and acknowledge this the spiritual dimensions of the more than human world, to in acknowledge the agency of a mountain, to acknowledge the agency that the tree has, that organisms has, and also the kind of ways in which our ancestors are intertwined with the natural world, mm -hmm. how they continue to live on in the natural world, and how they are spaces where we can reconnect with the more than human and with the ancestral through water, through forests, through all these kind of spaces that, that, that have been sacred throughout the history of humanity. So I think, you know, um, really just amplifying and, and trying to cultivate that sense of the sacred and awe and uh, there's those things beyond words mm. um, to try and put them into words. And on that Amen. very <laughs> note, uh, we are going to conclude this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. I encourage you to purchase these books, read the poetry, and get it signed. Uh, Peter and Bridget will be outside for book signings. And you can also come on to my event at five as well <laughs> if you run very fast. <laughs> <laughs> and have a wonderful open book festival. Thank you, everyone. Bye.